You taught for a period of time in your career. Yeah. You're a working professional. You're a public speaker. You're an author. You're an artist, not just a designer. Something that very few designers have been able to do, which is to have work that's considered art. I moved to New York at 19 and I knew what I freaking wanted. To the point that after like two years of school, I was asked to leave. I was happy about leaving design school and started working immediately. I'm having a great career and you want to share it. I want other people to have better careers. I want other people to, I want to facilitate their, their, their journey through this stuff. You shared a story on stage. I'm going to cue you up and hopefully it's enough for you to start telling a story here. Now I got into a little bit of trouble. Okay. So my next guest is James Victoria. And you may know of him from several different touch points. Maybe you've seen one of his works in the Museum of Modern Art. Maybe two of them you've seen. Maybe you've seen these big, bold, expressive phrases and ideas, these, these, I, uh, these concepts distilled into some words, and you see his handiwork. His, his hand is in the work, and maybe you've seen that. Or maybe you've seen him speaking on a stage where I met you for the first time in person. I've met you online before, James. Mm -hmm. But there's some things that I guess surprised me about you. And I'm just full disclosure. I don't know that much about you. I've known about your work for a really long time. I purchased your books before we even knew that we should be talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And I see you on stage, very natural, warm, charismatic. And I, I'm like, something is not, so I don't, I, I, I just, maybe it's my prejudice that I just thought a guy who writes the way you do, using the language that you do, fact perfection. I hope I said that right. Cause I'm yeah. scared to say that, you know, yeah. <laughs> is that I think of you as like really anti-establishment, a rebel, but I think there's rebel, but a rebel with a heart. Mm -hmm. There is this humanity that emanates from you. I think maybe you're a romantic. I don't know if you would describe yourself as such. Uh, yeah. As a dreamer, as a lover of things and deeply passionate person. Yeah. As a person who's not afraid to connect with people. And here's the other thing. You're a really fit guy too. <laughs> How, did you know <laughs> How dare you throw that on such a moment? You go on. You go on. <laughs> please. <laughs> Less about you, more about me, please. Yeah, you're really fit. I saw you walking around and I'm like, look at the, the uh, triceps on this guy. What's going on here? So I told Mark, and not Mark, who was there? I was there with a couple of my friends, with yeah. David Tallis. I'm like, dude, I got to, I use some push-ups on stage or something. I got to get pumped up because James is like just shown, it's a gun show here with James. What's going on? So <laughs> It's very sweet of you. Thank you. We don't usually associate designers and artists with being physically fit. Why are you so fit? Oh, it's just, um, I've got two little kids and I've got a young wife and I got to keep up with them. Um, I also just love it. I just love it. I've been a long distance runner since uh, before high school. Um, so I've always, I've always run. And um, I'm kind of classic alpha in that I'm only happy. And I shouldn't say this too loud because um, I'm only happy when I'm doing shit. I'm only happy when I'm, when I'm making. I'm only happy when I'm, when I'm producing things that I know are going to make money. And I'm only happy when I'm like exercising or active. I can't be, I can, I'm not very good like hanging out at the beach, sitting in a lawn chair with a drink, mm. right? I got to go to the beach and go surfing or got to go, you know, run up and down or, you know, so, you know, being, being physically fit and active, I think is just, just goes hand, hand in hand. Um, and it's funny about the, how the, that kind of dichotomy that you've felt or that pull that like, wait, this guy is that guy. Right. Um, early on in my career, because of the, because of the political and social and cultural work that I did that had tooth to it, I think people saw the work and didn't know me. And what happens when you do that is you, you, you misconstrue, um, passion for anger. So people think I was, the, you know, the angry young designer. And yeah, I can see that. I wasn't, I was passionate. I give a shit and I still give a shit. You know, and now I give a shit for, for, you know, the, the, the other people who make design. I mean, my work is, I mean, we just, we just, um, you know, under the influence of, of, of Shannon, um, uh, my new, you know, partner and wife, um, my website is no longer jamesvictory.com. Me, 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 me. My website is your work is a gift. Dot yeah. com. You know, and that's huge. That's, that's, uh, we want to be about other people. I've had a great, and I'm having a great career, you know, like you. 
and you want to share it. I want other people mm -hmm. to have better careers. I want other people to, I want to facilitate their, their, their journey through this stuff. Right. And I want to ask you a lot about this idea about your work as a gift and the story that you shared and I want you to share with our audience. But before we do that, you mentioned careers. I'm just curious, how many careers has James Victoria had? <laughs> I got a, I got a pal back in New York, a designer pal back in New York. And he says, he says, you know, they say most people get like, you know, three acts, you yeah. know, three, three, three phases of their life. He says, you're on like number seven. <laughs> 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 um, I have had one career. I see it as one career. I started, um, I started very early on. Like I moved to New York at 19 and I knew what I freaking wanted, uh, to the point that, to the point that after like two years of school, I was asked to leave. And I was happy about leaving design school and started working immediately. Um, but I knew what I wanted to do. And since the beginning, my work has always been about what it says, not what it looks like. But that doesn't mean that I'm trying to, I don't care. I, and, you know, effect perfection is about doing your best work, but not getting, not letting perfection stop you, you know, like per, in the form of perfection or procrastination or self-doubt or, you know, too much thinking or whatever. But um, so my work has always been about what it says. And now it's just kind of whittled down to really what it says. And, and the visuals are just the teaspoon of sugar to get these larger ideas across. Uh, so I think I've had just one long arc career and basically the, the details of how I, how I perform and the, and the audience and the intention has changed a little bit. It's always been the same. Okay. Fair enough. I like that. I guess the way I was looking at it is. You taught for a period of time in your career. Yeah. You're working professional. Now you've created a course or a subscription community. You're a public speaker. You're an author. You're an artist, not just a designer. Yeah. So the works that you've done, and you've done something that very few designers have been able to do, which is to have work that's considered art. Yeah. So that's why I'm like, I see lots of like, maybe you might see as one continuous arc. I see these peaks and I wouldn't say valleys, but different spikes in what yeah. you're doing. Yeah. But even the, even the, even the artwork yeah. is I paint in words. Mm. So it's still ideas and it's still typography and it's still somewhat design based. Much, much like, you know, Jasper, Jasper Johns would with, uh, or Robert Motherwell, cause they use a lot of typographically driven pieces um, or to, for me to go back early, early influences were like um, uh, Picasso and some of the, some of the boys back then, because they did a lot of posters to loose Lautrec. Majority of his work is posters mm -hmm. lineage of artists who were technically graphic designers could work with shape and form and color and type. Can you describe your own style of, putting thoughts on paper? Like, how do you describe that style? Um, I think there's, I think the word that I would use or the thing that comes up is immediacy. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want it to feel like work, first of all. I want it to feel immediate. Um, one thing I urge, um, especially when I have the opportunity to talk to younger designers, I tell them, listen, do yourself a favor and don't become a designer. Because designers tend to think like designers. They read all the same books. They dress the same. They, you know, um, and what happens then is you, is you, you, you teach yourself that there is an answer out there that you don't have. And that's not correct. The, your answer is, you know, comes from, comes from your opinion and your voice. And I want to use my opinion and my voice and I want to get it on the paper in the most immediate fashion. Um, the detriment of that is, Sometimes I do things that are somewhat um, illegible. You know, I, I often have, uh, I don't have a ton of clients. I don't seek that work right now. But um, but historically, I have had clients pull things back because they, they quote, quote unquote, couldn't read it. So, um, and that's fine. Um, I, either, I either alter it or I say, what couldn't you read? And they say, well, the G in gift. And I'm like, now, wait a second. <laughs> I don't quite understand that. <laughs> you can read it. It just took a little bit of time. So, and I'm, I'm fine with that. I don't mind when people have to think. Mm. I give them the benefit of the doubt that they can, that my, that my audience 
beyond a client that my audience is is intelligent and will make the effort. And if they don't, then they're not they're not they're not my audience. I think some young people, especially, uh, I'm assuming quite a bit of our audience are younger, at least in their pursuit of their career, and they they don't quite understand why one person would work harder to make something unique and risk being harder to interpret than to make it super clear. But here's the thing. Whenever this was a controversial thing. So let's 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 introduce into the conversation a new logo. I'd love to get your opinion and your take on it. And then I'll share my opinion because I've not spoken about this before. The internet, the internet designers, all of them, were kind of up in arms about how the new Kia logo was illegible. And people are Googling, like, what is this company? So there's a very strong opinion about it. I'll give you a couple of seconds here to think about what your opinion is. And then what is James Victoria take on the redesign of the Kia logo? You know, that's a great question. Um, because I remarked, I saw it early on. I'm driving along and I'm like, oh, that's the new Kia logo. And then I, cause I had driven by the, you know, there's a strip that I have to drive by here that has all the car dealerships. Right. <clears throat> and I see it has the old, literally spelled out K I A. <clears throat> and then it has the new one. And I thought, Oh, that's pretty funky. I dig that. And then somebody peed in the pool. Cause once you see it one way, you don't see the other, but somebody peed in the pool and said, Oh, did you, do you see the controversy about the KN logo? And I was like, what? Oh shit, now you just ruined it because now I can't, I cannot see but KN. Um, and I think, you know, business-wise, there were a bunch of different ways they could have handled that. I don't know. I, I guess they're maintaining it, right? Are they just keeping it, Chris? Do you know what? I, I haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they have any intention of changing it to anything no. else. No. And, you know, part of it, two things. One, it could be a, it could be a, a paint splatter. And if they do a really good job in a very short time, everybody will recognize that paint splatter as Kia. I mean, when when UPS changed their logo from the Paul Rand logo to the current one, people were like, ah, nobody's there anymore. No, nobody's there anymore. I'm not saying I'm not saying I love nostalgia. I'm not saying I hate change or that I love change, but I am saying we can get used to things. And um, that's just human nature. You know, it's funny because I was sitting with bre at breakfast this morning with my kids and my son was like, um, we have the Bon Mama jelly, which is the, the, the gingham tablecloth looking cover on it and a handwritten, literally a black and white handwritten basically label. And he was saying, he says how he liked the, the thing, how it looked like a tablecloth. I'm like, this is what I do. Like we, when we go to the grocery store this afternoon, we're going to go to the jelly section and look at all the jellies and figure out which one you would buy and why. Do you want it because it looks like someone's grandmother made it? Or do you want it because, you know, what are the things that attract us to these? And um, the, the it, if something is illegible or, or for example, if you go to the grocery store and there's some new jelly and it's all in French and you don't read French, you're like, that's interesting. I'm going to take that home because I'm cool, because I want to be erudite, because I want to be international. And you bring it home and it tastes like shit. <laughs> There's a problem, right? Now, so if Kia just does a good job, stays on course, yes, I would not want to be the guy who did that, <laughs> who, who, like, who like never saw KN, right? You just bring it home and show it to your kids, right? And they're like, KN. Um, I wouldn't want to be the guy who did that, but, um, I think if they do a really good job, like FedEx, like UPS, just do a damn good job and nobody will complain because they'd rather, I would, I would complain to the ends of the earth if your service was bad or if your car sucked, but if your logo was, you know, illegible for, to me for five minutes, I don't know. You know, again, we could talk about the, the new, the, the, what is it? The, we love New York thing. Same thing. Same thing. I, I, I think it's, I, I, you know, the, we love New York thing. I, I detest because it's, it's gone the way of all flesh. It looks like, you know, an emoji, which is like, Oh, okay. I get it. Emoji, lazy typography. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> so here's where I have some problems 
everybody seems so smart and so talented on the internet, but they're really not that talented. They're not that smart. True. So, you know, a while ago, there were, people were up in arms about all these luxury brands, like helveticizing everything that they do. They yeah. stripped away, like Burberry did it. A bunch of brands just moved towards very simple block and serif yeah. typefaces. And what they're saying is, in in one breath, we want funkiness, we want individualism, we want heritage, and we love the intricacies. And even if it's not legible and that easy to use and apply in many different things, so we hate these new marks. And then on the other side, we have Kia, the old logo, which is highly legible, yeah, but boring and kind of, in my opinion, ugly. Yeah. And we have this new form that becomes maybe beyond just a word mark, becomes an icon, which I think is wonderful. Yeah. Anybody with, I'm sorry to say this, I'm going to hurt a lot of people here, half a brain can figure this out. You know, we've done tests before where they literally scramble letters and words and you can still read it. It's because what we don't do is we're not actually looking at individual letters. We're recognizing shapes. So the people who know, who spend a lot of money working on these things, developing their craft, they know what they're doing. Not always, but they know what they're doing. Yeah. So everybody just relax. We want personality, but when the personality doesn't agree with the way we think, then we want it to be boring. Yeah. So for me, I look at the larger picture, the business model. I'm agreeing with you. If the car is a piece of crap, I don't, I don't care how good your logo is. And if the car is great, conversely, I don't care how bad your logo is. It doesn't matter because I'm not buying the car to drive the logo. Right? I'm, I'm buying it because it's a, it's, a, it's a piece of moving sculpture. There's a visceral connection with the machine and the sound. It's not the logo. Because let's face it, car companies have notoriously bad logos. And Just bad cars. Out there. I mean, ugly cars. Yeah, ugly cars too. Right? <laughs> So there's, there's more sins to like fight over here. Yeah. But here's here's where I think people are missing the bigger picture. And this is where I think we're going to bring it back to you in a second here. You, you, you love maybe a BMW. Most people don't even know where that symbol comes from. Can you even read it? No, because over time, like many things, you associate a unique symbol mark, word mark, with an idea, feeling of a consistent product or service. Mercedes is a three-pointed star. Many times people ask to, or who are asked to draw it, they draw the P symbol. They don't even know the symbol. And nobody's complaining about it. You know, so it's like everybody just relax. And I think it's a, it's a big, bold, and smart move for, for Kia and companies like Kia to move away from letter forms and moving into iconography. Mm -hmm. So hence, I never saw it as a KN and I could still unsee it. It doesn't bother me at all. It could be a lightning bolt for all I care. You know, Lamborghinis is a bull. You could barely read. Ferrari's lettering is terrible from a, just a purely design point, but I'm not buying it for that. Yeah. Okay, so when it comes to you and you writing something and somebody's like, well, well the G isn't quite legible, James. Now they're asking you to kind of change it. Yeah. To move away from why they hired you in the first place is, I think what you do is you inject a lot of personality and it's expressive. And most importantly, it's human. So we try it. I suppose you could draw them Helvetica if they wanted, but what's the point? Yeah. Well, Helvetica. <laughs> 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 but, the whole, but the whole book. Yeah. You know, but, you know, broken up in a weird way too, you know? Yeah. But the whole book right? is yeah. illegible. <laughs> so, yes, it's, yes. Yeah. I would never just use... Helvetica for in a traditional form. Yeah. You always have to, you always have to have that opinion in it. You always, there's always work. There's always something that you can do to make it, to make it interesting. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm with you with, 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 uh, you know, on, on, on the Kia logo, you know, um, there are, there are other fish to fry, right? I remember early on when I first started out, I was hanging out with, with designers and designs, you know, we were just getting out of school and it was design students and we'd go to a restaurant together and people would pick up the menu and they start talking about the typography. And I was just like, Oh my God, shut the fuck up. You know, like criticizing the freaking restaurant menu because of yeah. the bad typography or the bad spacing between letters or the letting or whatever. I'm like, Oh my God. Is the burger good? <laughs> I'll yeah. take the burger, right? Um, um, I try not to get into those things. I think there's a bigger, there's always a bigger picture. 
you know, there's a publisher that work that I work with that they're going to have their um, tenth. They're having their tenth anniversary this year. We've been working together for ten years, and I've done every single one of their covers. And their covers, many of them, are very close to illegible, very close to they're hard to read. But when they're displayed, they're displayed five at a time or ten at a time, or they're displayed at the Tate Modern in 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 London, or they're displayed like in the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, because there are other values to see. My covers say, be curious, pick me up. They don't say, this is a book about a death that occurred in a lake. <laughs> you know, I'm not trying to tell you what happens. I'm just trying to say, be curious, pick me up. Yeah. That is the job of a book cover, is it not? Yeah. Yeah. Pick it up. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, and then, we, then you read this bit, and then you read, oh, then you read this bit, and then you read the table of contents, and then you go like this, oh, dang, right? <laughs> it is It is a whole, it is a whole, it's, it's, it's the same hierarchy that you would use when designing a poster. Something big t to stop them, and then they can, then once they see the big thing, then they're going to go to the second, you, you, this is your typography lesson, right? Then they go to the hierarchy. What's the next thing I can see? Oh, it's a tagline or it's three words. That makes me curious because it goes or doesn't go with the image. And then you, 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 you come up with the, you come up with the, with, with, with the uppercut because you show them the logo and it completely blows their mind. Like that came from them. Like, oh my God, that's awesome. Or yeah. I'm still really freaking curious. Like, and then you walk away and you see it three more times. Like I've done a number of um, bus shelter and subway posters in New York City. And I never wanted to be clear. I never wanted to be clear because I knew my audience was going to walk by this twice a day, three, four times a week. And by the third or fifth or seventh, they're going to go, oh, fuck, I get it. That's awesome. Built in timing. I don't need, I don't need immediate I want that guttural, that immediate gut reaction, but I don't need immediate legibility. Mm. Um, I want to come back to some of this, um, but I just want to say this because I'm, I'm sure people are having a fit right now. <laughs> I want to just let you know, there is appropriateness. There's a time and place for super highly legible design. I love Helvetica as much as some of you love Helvetica. I also can appreciate somebody's handwriting as expressive typography and there's a time and place and i guess you wouldn't want to design the manual on how to operate life-saving equipment yeah. handwritten in bold expressive typography not appropriate of course and we want inappropriate you know it's funny because I, I you know um i mean i know what's appropriate and what's not appropriate and i try to play with the boundaries of that i remember uh, you know early on and uh, it hasn't happened in a while but I remember being in an, uh, on stage one time and having someone st stick up their hand and they said, you know, Mr. Victoria, your early posters were, you know, um, were um, not for profit. So basically you didn't have a client telling you exactly what to do. So, so are, don't you work more as an artist than a designer? And my answer, my only answer, and I'm not trying to piss anybody off or something, because I said, oh, you're one of those people who gives a shit about that. I don't see that delineation. You know, Paul Rand didn't see that delineation. You know, Ivan Chermayev, the the you know the big modernists, they 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 were they were commercial gra um, graphic artists, commercial artists, but they were artists, and they wanted that artistry in in their work. And the problem is, I don't see that as much anymore. I see either or. I see artists, and I see you know the the. <clears throat> The stuff that sticks to the script that 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 fulfills the um, the brief, and that is rather dull. Yeah. Okay. So I want to ask you how you developed this style of lettering and design. When did this come about, and when did you know, like, hey, I think I'm onto something here? Um, again, so so to make it a really kind of a short story, and when I when I was a kid. I love stories that start like that. And when I was a kid, my mom worked in the reference department of uh, the university library in our town. And we lived outside of town. We lived in a, you know, a dead end road outside of town. So I would walk from school and sit down and wait for my mom 
There was no bus. So I would wait for my mom to take me home. And it was usually like an hour and a half to two hours between the time school got done and when she left. She knew I liked to draw. So she gave me sheets of paper, typing paper and pen, and she gave me like um, picture books to look at. And the picture books that she was look that she gave me were graphiche and print and European design annuals from the fifties and the sixties and the seventies. So I unconsciously was getting this this um, education of of you know the history of graphic design. And I would like look at these things and I would like, you know, try to like draw them or try to do something different or try to whatever. Um, and so early on, my influences were these kind of old guys um, who eventually I met most of them, mm. which is really cool. I just like got up one day and said, you know, I could go to France and I could meet this guy and this guy and go to Switzerland and meet, you know, Mendel and Oberer and I could meet, you know, all these kind of heroes. Um, um and I kind of, it was kind of an amalgam of, of amalgam, amalgam of like being interested in Franz Klein, the painter, being interested in Motherwell's and knowing art. And my parents had a lot of art books in the house when I was a kid from, from, from Norman Rockwell all the way to the, the abstract stuff. Um, and all of this, all of this influenced me. Like if I, if there was a typographical influence that was strongest in me is like, I want to make work like Franz Klein, but I want it to be words. Like his stuff is just these broad strokes or Cy Twombly or some of these kind of um, um, American abstract artists who just do the, the work just, it, when I see it, it just, it moves my heart. And that's the thing I want. That's the thing I want in my work. I just want, I want to do work that people just go, ah, you know, there's, there's, there are three ways to, 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 to get into some, inside of a person. You can do it intellectually, you can do it through the heart, or you can do it through the groin, right? You can just go, yeah, it can be shock factor. Um, I want to, in, to, 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 I want a mix of, of, uh, of all three sometimes, but it always, always has to be smart. It always has to be, to be, to be, um, an, an intellectual process not an emotional process mm. you are a very fortunate person to have parents who surrounded you with art and design and to have a mom who kind of paid attention to what you're interested in and had the access to to graffiti and some of these magazines and books that you were talking about because most of us don't even know what the heck that is and then the fact that you got exposed to this at a very young age like how old were you standing there waiting for your mom at the bench or whatever mm. looking at these books Really? Yeah, 10, 11, 12. Wow. And, um, um, and on top of that, my father, like I was reared in the military and my father w uh, flew um, and he was away most of my childhood. Um, but when he came back, he would bring back magazines and <clears throat> um, uh, posters, bullfighting posters from Spain and manga and early car comic books from Thailand. And I just like, what the hell is all? And, it, and the interesting things, Chris, is that it was like words that I didn't, I, you know, that weren't translated. So that was, I was just looking at the shapes of them. And, and it was fascinating, really fascinating. Although I do remember once they brought me back a toy that had batteries in it and um, it stopped working. So I open it up and I take out the batteries and they're little triple A's, but they are black and yellow and they've got like Japanese script all over them. And, they're just fascinating, like little bumblebees or something. And I went, I went to my father and I was like, look at these batteries. Like, I'm trying to explain to him like the, the intricacy. And he's like, he's like, what do you care? They're just batteries. And I was like, wow, interesting. <laughs> Not everybody gets it. Not everybody cares. That's fine. That's fine. Not everybody, you know, I'm not for everybody. You know, I'm not for everybody, just the sexy people. I don't, I don't, I, I understand that not everybody's going to like my, my work. Not everybody's going to appreciate my angle. Not everybody, you can't, you can't appeal to everybody. It's just impossible. Um, and the people who I remember once being on stage and somebody was like really livid, really livid that I was saying, listen, if you're just dealing with typography and color, you know, uh, you're leaving so much more on the table. You were leaving so much on the table and they were just, you, me, you're discounting, you know, I was discounting like their, 
their classical design education that never once said, what do you think? What's your opinion? I want to get back to the question, though. When did you develop this lettering style that you're so well known for? When, when did you know that this was going to work? I started as a book jacket designer. Mm-hmm. When I quit, when I quit, uh, when I quit uh, the art school, and I was at, I was, think I was 21. Mm-hmm. And I literally started working professionally like three or four months after I dropped out of school and had not stopped. Okay. But when I first started, I worked out of one of my teacher's um, studios. And he was classic book just di- book designer from the 40s and the 50s and the 70s. I mean, his, you know, he had done everything. All the big name covers, all the big name authors from Fitzgerald all the way through. So my my work, I would look at him and go, oh, that's what a book jacket looks like. Right. And I'm and for the for the first year or more uh, of my career, maybe a couple of years, I was making book jackets look like book jackets. And now I call that I was making the obvious more obviouser. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I was, I was following the rules that I saw in the bookstore. Uh, self-help books look like this. Romance books look like this, right? There were rules. Um, and then one day I started like, um, I was making good money too because I was following the rules and being a good boy, right? But I had no opinion whatsoever. So one day I was like, I'd made money. I'd bought my first motorcycle cash. I was wearing nicer clothes. And I was like, you know what? I'm a funny guy. <laughs> I'm funny. I'm charming. I have my own sense of humor, my own sense of timing, my own sense of color, my own sense of style and proportion and this and that. Um, and at the same time, I started about the same time Chip Kidd started. So I'm looking over, looking over his shoulder and I'm like, hey, that guy is pretty sexy. He's doing good stuff. So I started putting my own handwriting in. I don't know. I know the very, I had had it around here for a while. The very first cover that I just did my own handwriting. Um, and it didn't get turned down. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, okay, let's push this a little further and see how far we can go. Um, so all the, 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 where I am with my, t- especially if we're talking about typography, where I am with that now is at an interesting place because I've gotten a little bit bored because it's just my handwriting. I use different tools to kind of manipulate it. I use like, um, like a, uh, 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 might, might use a, a sumi brush or I might use a, a big, a big Sharpie paint pen. And then I cut up the, the tip to make it kind of a, more of a mop than a pen, you know? Um, but I've gotten a little bored of my handwriting and I'm looking for something new now. I'm looking for some new way to influence or some new letter forms or, you know, even more cruder more abstract, more artistic forms to put on the page. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, 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 it's been a long process and it's influenced by, you know, early, early designers. It's influenced by um, European designers. It's influenced by um, painters. And, um, and now I'm just trying to, I'm trying to, I, I don't want to hide. You know, I've always just been like, people say, you know, your work, your, your handwriting is so iconic. It looks like James Victoria. And I'm like, that's all I've ever tried to be is James Victoria. I just want to get paid to be James Victoria. I want everybody to get paid to be themselves. That would be, that's awesome. And that's what you do, which is awesome. It's just like, you don't hide behind shit. You don't have to make shit up. You're just like, this is what I do. And this is who we are. And this is how we do it. Mm. Right. Yep. Now, it can be hard for someone to hear this because I, I think, and I don't think I'm going out of limb by saying this, James. I think you and I and others like us are the exception versus the norm. Yes. And because of that, that's why I teach now. Yeah. That's why you do. Yeah, right. But it, 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 it can be difficult because this is usually what people say. I, I talked to Carlos Segura about the same thing. I love Carlos. There, yeah, he's like, where everybody's like, you could be bold and you can do this because you're Carlos Segura. And he goes, no, because I do this, I am Carlos Segura. It's not yeah. the other way around. People, people do that. Mean that they're like, hey, oh, that's okay for you. You're James Victoria. Yeah. Like, no, 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 no. I have always, always, since I was 22 or 23, I've always pushed to be James Victoria. And that means there are some times when you fail. Yeah. You need to accept that. 
you seem to be a person who has high self-awareness, who has leaned into all the good and the bad, super transparent, vulnerable. How would, what, what do you think the perception of the James Victoria brand is? And does it align with your concept of who you are? Um, I have a fairly good idea of the perception of me because um, I'm, I'm very active on social media and I respond to yes. everybody. And the feedback that we get is, 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 um, pretty spot on. Um, um, uh, so I think that what I'm trying to put out into the world is, is working, um, merely by testimonials alone. Um, um, I never, I think I was, I think I'm writing a new blog piece. Uh, I'm writing like a couple things at a time here. So um, I th there's a new blog piece where I'm basically really trying to be like super honest how I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just doing it. Um, I don't want to know the ending, <laughs> you know? Um, but I think that um, because of the feedback, like I got a, I got a, I got a, um, a text out of the blue. I haven't spoken to this guy in like over a year, maybe more. Um, very prolific author, uh, was a, a kind of a, a, a pal of mine. We know each other fairly well. He's, he's mentioned me in his books. Um, and he, out of the blue, he was just like, Hey, thank you for doing what you're doing. He says, you know, you're, you're pushing for creativity and you, you know, you free all of us. And I was like, Who's us, John? <laughs> Who is us you're talking about? But to, to get that from up here is kind of awesome. Um, or to, you know, to get the, 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 the kindness that you show me is, is kind of awesome, you know? Because I'm, I'm, I'm at heart, I'm like everybody else. We are. We're all like everybody else. I'm like everybody else. I want to be liked. I want to, I, I don't, I don't want to do work that makes people go, well, oh, fuck you. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, I'm not a, um, I'm not a divider, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm both playing on a swing <laughs> high. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, obviously. <laughs> okay. Well, if, if, if people, if you were reading the comments right now, scanning for like who they think you are, what are the three words they would say James Victoria is? Um, I don't know. I guess I, I would hope that the, uh, people say uh, um, authentic or vulnerable. That's uh, that's one word, <laughs> and um, possibly bold. Um, um, and it would be really it'd be really great if they said hey, this guy's really fucking funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know, I mean, I want a certain amount of wit. Yeah. And I don't like the word clever. Clever is, is demeaning, but I like the, you know, I want to, I want to make smart work. Um, I want, um, you know, interesting thing in that, in those words is, um, I woke up a bunch of years ago and my commercial, the commercial aspect of my, of my work was waning. And I was like, what, what is that? Why? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not actively going, I don't have an agent actively looking, but and I realized that, you know, as you progress in yet older, um, you know, the lives of, it's the lives of the artists. Oh, the first part is who is James Victoria, right? So nobody knows who you are and you're just toiling and you're trying to do good work. The second is get me James Victoria. And that's when, when you're doing good work. The third part is get me someone like <laughs> James Victoria, right? It's like, get me the cheaper version. Get me the, you know, the younger version. And then the fourth part is who is James Victoria? And you don't want that. You don't want where you fade out, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, so I realized to stay vital and to just basically keep doing what I like doing, I needed to switch from actually making the commercial work to one, becoming my own client, you know, getting rid of the middleman basically and be becoming my own client. Um, and two, um, what older people get paid for is their wisdom and their knowledge and to share that. Um, so now hence writing books, spending a lot more emphasis on writing and sharing ideas, um, being, being um, um, open and available through uh, social media, that kind yeah. of stuff. Mm -hmm. 
So let me just get this straight. There's there's like four stages that people go through if they're lucky. Like some are not even that lucky. Yeah. You start out with in who is this person in total anonymity. Nobody cares. Everybody's doing their own thing. Yeah. You've not done enough work that gets you noticed. And then eventually you do something consistently enough that people are like, wow, there's something about this character. So now they are like, you're in demand. You're the yeah. name on the tip of everyone's tongue. You're the top of the list. Yeah. Get me James Victoria. And then you get to a certain point of success, right? Or yeah, or Christo. And you get to a certain point of success where maybe you're too expensive now. And somebody's like, give me a knockoff version of James. Yeah. Well, they, yeah. I literally, literally when my first book came out, when Who Died and Made Your Boss, people like would get in touch with me and they, they'd say, oh, I thought because that book came out, a coffee table book, they were like, I thought you were dead. And, or, <laughs> or, or, or they now think that you're too expensive. Or they now think that, oh, he wouldn't, oh, well, he, we can't call him. He would never touch right. our work. You know, these weird things. Yeah. And then you, you kind of hit that, that pinnacle. And then after a while, there's the new newness, the new hotness. And then you're kind of part of like the old guard and no longer relevant. And so you're saying, Hey man, you don't want to slip into the night quietly. (laughs) You want to share your knowledge. You want to still make a ruckus as Seth Godin would say. Yeah. And you help move the ball forward, which I think is a great point for us to transition to the next part of the conversation, which I know we want to land here. You sharing a story on stage. I'm going to cue you up and hopefully it's enough for you to start telling a story here. <laughs> now, I got into a little bit of trouble because I use this term bricklayer. I say we're all bricklayers. If we're doing production, if we're not thinking, we're not consulting, we're not advising, we're bricklayers. And there's nothing wrong with that. Now, you have a story, quite literally, I believe, of a bricklayer. Can you share that story? Because it was really moving. Yeah. You know what? You mind if I read it? Please. Because it's because it came it comes from the book. Okay. All right. It comes from Effect Perfection. Um hang on one second. I might have to put my my specs on here. All right. Take your time. Ah, this is for these are for protection purposes. <laughs> Drug. <laughs> Safety first, bird. Safety goggles. So the yeah, uh, it, it's 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 chapter 10 in the book, and it's called um, You Were a Lot in Life. I had a young protege. This is a true story, by the way. Um, he wanted to be a screenwriter, but his father encouraged him to be a bricklayer like himself. It was his lot in life, his father said. The arts don't make money. Bricklaying is a decent wage, and the world needs bricklayers. You'll be one like me. So for 10 years, my young savant laid bricks and swallowed his dreams. Um, One day, his father's best friend died, presumably from laying bricks. At the funeral, the father got up to read a eulogy that he had written. My friend was moved to tears, not by the eloquence of the goodbye, but by the realization that his father was a writer. So we deny ourselves our dreams so hard you know i mean this kid this kid his 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 father should have been an author he should have been a poet he should have been you know um i was just telling i was just telling shannon the other day about a a a, a pub when i was um first starting out as a book jacket designer where i there was a pub that i used to hung at, hang out on a little blarney stone on 57th street tiny little place um, um, I go there after, after my shift as a book check designer, right? I go like at five o'clock and it was all, um, cops and sanitation workers. And these guys were politically astute and hilarious and charming and funny. Any one of them could have been, could have turned into Seinfeld. Any one of them, they were that smart and that sharp and that funny and just to hear them and t- have conversations, I'm like, God, you're a fucking genius. You didn't know that, <laughs> you know. But they would, w- they, and they, and they would go like my father, would like, nah, nah, nah. I could never do that. Well, I could never do that. Right? We just deny it so hard. So his father was like, No, you're gonna be a bricklayer, and 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 he's now a writer. He's now a screenwriter, like he wanted to be. So. It's a beautiful story. There's a lot of lessons to unpack in it. And when you told that on stage, 
it hit me. Like how I was resonating with the audience. I was feeling something and I looked around the room and I see them feeling something too. The first part is the denial of one's gift and one's passion and true pursuit for the practical, the pragmatic. Yeah. Reasonable. The reasonable and responsible. Right. And, and there's a clear plan forward and there's comfort and safety in that, in that if you join the guild, if you become an expert, expert Mason. Yeah. There's a path. person, you know, and you, there's a path and we know it's predictable and we, we can have a certain life. Maybe it's not the life we wanted, but it's a life. You don't have to be a burden on your family or society. And so the father says to his son, give up your dream of screenwriting because it's like winning the lottery. Yeah. And instead of listening to his mentor, he's like, I probably, you know, my more, more influential mentor is my father better do what he says. And so he does that. And it's only in this moment that he realizes his dad has done the exact same thing. He suppressed his dream and that maybe this writing thing runs in the family. <laughs> And he doesn't want to make the mistake again. Yeah. So it's that moment that he, he cries to see, like, per, perhaps I'm, I'm interpreting too much here. It's like the wasted opportunity of talent and, and the gift that his father was given. Because presumably the father before him, his grandfather, had a similar conversation mm -hmm. with his father. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like the battery story with my dad. It was like my father, you know, my father built the house we grew up in. It was an amateur chef, an amateur photographer, you know, what I would say, wildly creative. Yeah. But I asked my mom, after my dad passed, I asked my mom, I said, hey, you know, if I, if you, if you asked dad if he was creative, would, would he, you know, admit to that? She'd go, no, oh, never, never, never. But if I asked my dad, hey, 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 dad, can you, can you figure anything out? He'd say, oh yeah, I can figure anything out. And to me, that's what, that's what we do. You give me a project, you give me something to build, you give me something to break, you give me something to fix, you give me something, I figure it out. You give me some, you give me some blank canvas and, 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 uh, and, and a nice chick. <laughs> and, and, you know, I can, I can figure out, um, even though neither of my parents wanted me to do this and they still don't, you know, they never understood until they, until I took them to the, to the MoMA. For my, for my first show, they, they didn't, they only understood that I owned a house and had children. And, um, those were the two things that they knew about, uh, but anything else they didn't really understand. And, and, and I am, I am who I am, um, because of them and in spite of them. It's kind of interesting how we respond. Like your, your mom feeds you with design magazines and introduces you to the world of art and culture, but doesn't think that that might be your career? Is that, there's a disconnect there. It's pretty profound, you know? Yeah. Well, I think to them, there, there's this term that, um, that should be stricken from all language and lexicons and slang, slang. And, uh, it's just the, the term is a starving artist. Yeah. Uh, because we throw that around. <clears throat> here's, you know, here's another story like that, Chris is, um, is I had another, uh, another protege who I was um, going through a, a series of coaching with a private coaching and, um, um, he wanted, he wanted to be a poet. And early on in the conversation, I said, so, you know, what, what were the block? What are the blocks? Let's deal with, let's go backwards. Let's go find the blocks. Let's go find those pre-recorded voices that said, no, no, no. And he said, well, you know what? I, I remember showing a collection of things that I had written in high school to my uncle who I thought was, you know, creative. And his uncle said, oh yeah, no money in poetry. Don't, don't, you know, don't pursue that. So I was talking to my guy, my student, and I said, is your uncle still alive? And he said, yeah, he is. I said, okay, go back and go talk to him and go ask him how many poems he tried to get published. Go ask him how many he wrote. Go ask him what efforts he put in. Or did he just pull that expression out of his ass? Because it's a lie. I personally know three people making a damn good living as poets with books and tours and, the, and, the, and they're just humping and they love it. It's not a hustle. They just love it. So, so, you know, there's all these stigmas out there that don't, that aren't really true. Uh, 
When do we know when it's time to say maybe that was a hobby and not something I could make into a career? Never. Or do we go to the grave push, pushing and, and persevering, but never achieving any kind of real success? If you do that alone and don't share and don't talk to people and don't ask the right questions, then yeah, you'll go to the grave, you know, pissed off. <laughs> but never, never stop. Never stop. I've seen, Chris, I've seen so many people. I follow so many people on, on Instagram and uh, in different ways and, yeah. and they're vocal to me. So that, so I look at their work. I, it's, some of these people I'm like, look at, I'm like, Ooh, you know, there's, there's this one gal, she, she draws flowers, she paints flowers. And I'm like, Ooh, damn, like, Oh, what do I tell this woman? What do I tell this woman? I'm like, right. awesome. Keep going. And you know what? Dollars to donuts. When I see these people later on, I'm like, fuck. She's doing the work. Uh, She's doing the work. It's getting better. Even if your work, even if you think your work is bad, keep going because eventually it's going to get good. You know, we're terrible judges. We're, te I'm a terrible judge of my own, my own, my own beauty, my own strength, my, the quality of my work, the, 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 the power of my words. I'm a terrible judge, but I just keep going. And I talk to people. I ask for what I want. You know, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a list of, you know, I still, this book has been out, you know, two years. And I still have a list and create a, a, a list. When a name comes up, I package this sucker up in a nice box with stickers and a nice letter. And it goes out to this chef that I've just heard about who's just put the best pizzas in the world. And he lives in Phoenix or, or Rick Rubin, you know, his new book is just like, oh my, I'm like, oh my God, Rick and I, you, we speak the same language. You're getting my book. You know, I'm just going to try to reach you. You know, we just keep seeking mentors and keep asking questions and keep talking to people. If you work in a closet and you just keep stacking paintings up, you know, uh, you're expecting dealers to, and, and buyers to come to your house. <laughs> Ding dong. <laughs> When you saw this person's work, this woman who draws flowers, and you're like, ooh, that wasn't like, ooh, like that was amazing. I was like, ooh, this is not very good. Yeah. That was like, like okay, oh, I just want to clarify. <clears throat> yeah. Right. And there's the part of you who says in your brain, like, this is terrible. Oh my gosh, where's this going to go? And then there's the part of you saying, you know what? Keep going. Keep going. I don't know how to reconcile that in myself. I have to be honest with you. And I have to ask you this question too. I know you taught for 20 plus years at the School of Visual Arts. Your students would bring in work and it was like, ooh, this is not very good. Were you like, all right, keep going? Or would you say like, uh, you know, this is uninspired work. It feels derivative or it, it's like, I think you need to put more time and love in, into this because I'm not seeing it here. Yeah, I mean, that's what I said about, you know, talk to other people, get direction. Um, so once, once, once I can, once I have a foothold besides something to say, you know, ugh, that's terrible. Um, and like I said, even if it doesn't speak to me, yeah. you know, that's not important. Well, I'm a terrible judge of other people's work too. You know, it's like people say, Hey James, take a look at my portfolio. I'm like, okay, here's my standard answer. My opinion of your portfolio doesn't matter. What matters is how your work makes you feel. What matters is how consistent, how much practice you put in. And what matters is how you, good you are at getting it out the door, right? There's work out there that I think is terrible, but it's successful. So who am I? So, but what I can say to someone who's drawing flowers and I think, okay, uh, is at some point I, I can start adding some, some <clears throat> quality criticism. Say, hey, have you looked at so-and-so's work? Hey, have you ever thought of <clears throat> putting it together in this, in this, you know, <clears throat> in a, in a, in a, in a, a form besides individual, just individual, like make a drawing, put it aside, make a drawing, put it aside, make a drawing, put it aside. Most people know how to like put ink on paper, but they don't know what to do after that. Like, how do I, now, how do I get rid of this? How do I commercialize this? That's a big question. And that's a very individual question too. You know, it's not like there's one blanket statement on how to commercialize your work. You know, one is, one is, first of all, you have to like the work. Second, you know, if you like it enough to be, be consistent about it. 
Second is to be able to show it to people and, and, and how to talk about it, you know, how to be brave enough to show your work, you know, um, um, and then figure out how to, how to, um, um, how to sell it, how to put a price on it. Are you making a book? Are you selling individual prints? Are you doing this? You know, I've got one guy who I, who I, who I, who I been talking to for, for a bunch of years and it's extremely frustrating to work with him because he keeps jumping ship. He keeps losing faith in himself. And it's like all, all of a sudden he's showing like watercolors. I'm like, well, what about those other things you were doing? Those are pretty good. Just, you know, be cool. Stay with it. You know, when people start, people, I'm, I, and I have to say, listen, people won't know what you do. They won't know what you stand for. Like I said earlier, I paint with words. That's, that's my thing. Like I try to come up with strong, powerful phrases and put them into a form that make them memorable like you know you know go f yourself for example um which is that's only that's a test because if you come up with if all you can come up with is go fuck yourself that shows a lot about you you know <laughs> right as there's a frame print <laughs> right behind you <laughs> yeah yeah what does that say about james victory says like this is a test right here Mm -hmm. underneath it you know um um and people love this print because they take it home and then they put post-it notes over it so it says free or find or fuel or you know feel or you know which is awesome yeah. um but yes yes it's it is it is tricky chris but i think that i think that um i have to i have to i have to give people i think a big part of my job or my role is to give people permission mm. I don't want to do that, but I need to give people permission. I had a, uh, uh, there was a, a, I just got back from Barcelona. You know, we met in uh, Croatia. I just got back from Barcelona. And the story I told in Barcelona was a friend of, a, a pal of mine, literally, um, um, he's been a mark, he's been marketing for years. I mean, we used to play tennis together in New York when I, in our early twenties, he's been, he's been in marketing for years and he writes me and he shows me all these goofy drawings that he's been doing. He says, James, I've been doing these drawings about my life. He says, I think that's what I want to do. I want to be an illustrator and I want to tell these stories about my life. I want, you know, I want to be an artist. Do you, do you have any advice? His name is Norman. And I said, I said, Norman, I think you're already an artist. I just keep going. You know, and I think, I think we need that. We need encouragement. We need someone to give us permission. We need, um, um, we need some guidance. You know, I also wrote to him and said, what do you want? Some fucking fairy dust? Like, you know, there's no magic. I can't give you any magic, but I can give you, I can give you encouragement and I can give you some inspiration and I can give you some, and along the way I can possibly say, awesome. Here's a vein. Here's a vein. Here's some other, here's a three, here's three other people who are doing exactly what you want. Look at them, what they're doing. See if there's something there for you, you know, go look at, I don't know. Saul Steinberg's work or, you know, like, I don't know who, see if there's some venue. Do you want to work editorial in magazines or you just want to publish on your own, have your own story and your own little books and start selling that. Um, and there's a, there's the, there's so many different ways to play it out that I can't predict what's going to work for somebody, but I can give them encouragement and I can give them permission. Mm -hmm. When you said vein, are we talking about the vein in a body or a vein like a weather vein pointing in a direction? Uh, oh. A vein like a body, I mean, I mean, I mean a path. There are so many different paths that work can take. Yeah. I like to draw flowers. What do I do with them? Okay. Do you want them in museums? Do you want to sell them on cards and, you know, in, in, in bookstores? Do you want a collection of them? Or do you want, you know, what's the, where do you want to, that's, and that's just like the commercial end of it. Like, how do I, how do I unload these drawings? Uh, I, I just have a crazy thought, an observation here. Is what you do in encouraging people to be more of themselves and to pursue what makes them happy, a way of you parenting the way that you wish your dad might have parented you? <laughs> There's the crazy question. You are gonna make me cry again? <laughs> um, Is it, James? I when I was telling that story about uh, the in Barcelona about my friend Norman, 
I literally said, and in my best, most fatherly tone, I said, I think you're already an artist. Keep going. Um, yeah, no, totally, totally. I mentioned it to my kids the other day at dinner and, and, and my wife was like, mm -hmm. um, we, we were chatting and I'm, um, I'm very gushy with them. Right. Um, yeah. I'm stern and, but I'm also like a, you know, I'm a stern, like disciplinary dad. Um, but I'm also very gushy and very hands-on with them. And it was funny because I had said, um, I said something to my boy, um, um, and I, I, it kind of got quiet for a second. And I said, I said, Wyatt, I wish once in my lifetime, my dad had said that to me, right? He would just change, change your direction. You know, I see it in my protege. I see it in people who come to work with me or people who like want to study with me. Um, they, they, we talk about, I try to make them hip to their subconscious, you know, the pre-recorded voices that's, that just constantly tell you no. You know, we're all born wildly creative. The guy, the guy, you know, on the roof across the street fixing someone's roof, wildly creative guy, could be a genius, could be a painter, could be, wakes up in the morning with brilliant ideas, but just doesn't follow through on them because of these pre-recorded voices. No, you've got to go to work. No, you've got a family. No, you have to do this. No, you have to, right? Um, and those voices come from, originally from family. I had an assistant from, from Russia who came and worked with me for a summer and she got real comfortable with us. And she, at lunch, she told us this story that she want, always wanted to be an artist. So where she was, she came to us, her company paid for her to be in New York for three months to work with us. And her company did um, um, event marketing. So they did like big, huge concerts and all kinds of stuff. And she worked there, but she wasn't really a designer, right? She worked close to designers, close to the artists. And she tells us a story about how she always wanted to be an artist, always wanted to paint, always wanted to draw. And her parents took her to the museums when she was a little kid. And she says, one day they took me, we went to a museum or a gallery and I came home and I wanted to express to my parents how much I loved them and how much um, I wanted to be an artist. She said, I sat down and I drew the most meticulous, the most beautiful thing I could draw a picture of both of my parents holding hands. And then she says, now I called my parents into my room and I drew the picture on the wall and they flipped. And in that fucking moment, Chris Doe, in that fucking moment, they destroyed her. They destroyed any possibility of her actually being an artist. She will always work close to artist. She will never make that leap because that thing is so strong in her, so embedded that she's going to get her hands slapped. So I wrote a piece on this um, and it's called It's Only Paint. Like if you can't, if you, you know, we have to, we have to let our kids do this shit. And the problem, you know, the problem is you let the genie out of the bottle, you know, Creativity out of the bottle is dangerous. So you got to be ready for that. You got to give it a safe space. You got to say, okay, we're going to do this. <laughs> like even with, even with my kids, I'm like, if they, if they mention the word paint, I'm like, outside. <laughs> we're going outside. <laughs> it's raining. We're going in the garage. <laughs> I'm like, it's going to be everywhere. Oh my God. <laughs> I can't handle it. <laughs> <laughs> but James, it's only paint. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. You have to remind yourself. I know. <laughs> but it's I give them huge pieces of paper and give them a yeah. lot of space and let them, let because or else if I do it in the house I'll give them huge piece of paper or I'll do all this stuff but I'm gonna I'm not gonna be calm and I can't do that yeah so yeah. but these things stop us so with everybody I kind of try to take them back through you know say what's stopping you yeah what's the belief because I'm gonna show you that it's a lie yeah can't make money as a poet lie. Right? Don't draw on the walls. A lie. All this shit. Mm, okay. Rules. Yes, I get it. Respecting of the house. Respect property. I get that shit. Uh, I understand. But it's really just fucking paint. What's more important? I say this to my kids all the time. They make it. They, they drop something in a truck and they're like, well, I'm sorry, Dad. I'm like, dude, what's more important? 
you are this truck. He's like, oh, I am. I'm like, yeah. Remember that. <laughs> okay. So I, I see like you as this Russian nesting doll. <laughs> okay. So let me see if I can just pull them apart and show people what I see. On the outside is James Victoria, the designer who sometimes makes book covers. And you pull that apart. And then inside of that is an artist. And you pull that apart and you see a writer and you pull that apart and you see a philosopher yeah. you pull that apart and you see a therapist and a loving human. Oh, you ain't going to make me cry again. Damn, that's pretty good. Um, yeah, philosophy and uh, quite frankly, therapy, because I mean, it is art therapy, right? Yeah. I like that you, you, you talk about these things. I think you have much more loving, nurturing, encouraging energy than I do is something I need to work on. But we have, I think, similar goals. That's why what you say really resonates. With I feel you. it. Right? We just take different approaches. And I think the world's more beautiful if there's more than one approach yeah. versus one homogenized, like you must do it this way approach. You say, and I'm reading your LinkedIn bio, says, I help you get paid to do what you love. What is the future's mission? To help a billion people make a living doing what they love. We want to help creatives these people who are born wildly creative that go out there and not let that one voice, that one story, that narrative that you can't do this, this is impractical yeah. to help them fulfill that passion, that desire. Because I believe this, if people do what they love, they'll be happier. Yeah. And happy people have stronger relationships to make for better parents. And they make more money. They make more money and there will be less fighting. There will be less wars. There will be less hate crimes. There will be less murder. There be, and the world will be a more beautiful place because we're living to our highest potential. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Correct. At the very top is self-actualization. So James Victoria, you're helping them to move from, I need to make money because I got to buy food, shelter, clothing. So you teach them a way up so that they can realize their highest. Yeah. Without, you know, without jumping ship and quitting their job. You know, I get a lot, of, I get, I quite frankly get people who like, uh, we took down all our YouTube videos, but, 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 uh, I get people who like would write me and say, you know, a couple of years ago, I watched a video of you and I quit my job and now I'm doing this and this and this and this. And I'm like, wait, 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 you quit your job. You didn't talk to me first. Like, what are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> what did you say on your video? You know, fact perfection. I'm, I'm affected. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, let's transition to where where I need to catch up with you, which is you got a new site. It's called Your Work as a Gift. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that you recorded it at your own expense some very high production lessons, video content yeah. to teach people some of these things. Where are you at with that? And tell me a little bit more about Your Work as a Gift. Um, yeah, Your Work as a Gift is one of the one of the central core ideas from um, Fact Perfection, the book. Um, and the whole idea is that you pretty much, you put it fairly succinctly earlier is that when you were talking about when you're happy, right? So like, you know, I, I just, I, I told you we're at a new house and because of the new house, I'm like, Hey, I don't know how much shit's going to cost. I don't know how much the heating and the gas and the, this. So, so I kind of cut back on shit and I, and I, and I quit my gym one because I don't live next to the gym anymore. I'm in a new, you know, two neighborhoods over and I drove by a gym and I was, I came back to Shannon and I was like, Hey, it's a really kind of groovy gym. And I like the people and, and she said, do it. Like, no, it doesn't matter what it costs. Do it. She says, when you, when you exercise, you are happier, then you're more productive and then you make yeah. more money and then you're right. So, um, but your work as a gift is, um, when you, when you understand that your work is a gift. Um, it changes how you think about your work. It changes um, um, what you make and who you work for. Um, um, because you now understand that you no longer, your, 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 your purpose is no longer to gain a paycheck or satisfy a boss or a client. Your purpose is to, is to give something of yourself. 
You start, you start putting yourself in your work. You know, you, your purpose is to make yourself happy first. And if you can do that, if you can make yourself happy, that excitement breeds excitement. And then now you start to make other people happy. You know, before I was a commercial designer, I, I had a bunch of odd jobs when I was in New York in, in art school, but I always drew and I always had little funny captions and I would leave them all over the place. I worked at a publishing house. I worked at Simon & Schuster for three, four months in a summer. And I would do these, people collected these things, kept them in their office. I knew that my real work, it had some meaning to it. So why was I designing book jackets for shit I didn't care about? You know, they just put, they give you a couple of envelopes, do those. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so when your work is a gift, what you're giving of people is something of yourself. And that, that has value. Like the, the girl with the flowers, she's got to figure out that level. Um, I think... We have very similar ideas. You just have better writing. I shouldn't say <laughs> You've got better filming, so, you know, we should work together. You know, like you write better, you know, and you letter better and you uh, you have the accolades of an artist. And it, when you say your work is a gift, I've been going on stage saying to people, you are the gift. Mm -hmm. And... And for, for gifts to work, you can't keep them. You have to give them to people. Yeah. The gift of and, share. And yeah. if you study, like I did, the etymology and the roots and read about the gift, um, the gift is to the giver. Uh, the gift is to the giver. Right? And then if you look in, in poetry and literature, um, uh, Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet, there's a line that says, the more I give the more I have for both are infinite. Mm -hmm. It's out there. I mean, it's, 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 it's right out of Napoleon Hill, man. <laughs> right. Um, it's, it's just really hard for people to stomach that idea, Chris, right? You know that it's really hard for people to grasp onto that and go, really? But my mom doesn't like my work. <laughs> or they don't understand it or or I got criticized for for drawing in my books when I was in grade school all these silly things that happen to us that become major blocks to us just allowing ourselves to be free and, I, and, and that's one thing I wanted to sh say to you is I think that there's something similar in what you and I do in that um, we 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 work to give people um, a certain amount of freedom yeah that's financial cool. freedom, creative freedom. Yeah, I, I want financial. I don't want. I don't want. I don't want hoodlums out there just quitting their job and writing graffiti and living in a you know in a shack. I want successful, powerful, creative people. If I'm one of these self-identified free-range humans and I want to play in the Victory verse, how do I go down this rabbit hole? <laughs> Where do I go? What do I need to look up? What does it cost me? What do I get? Yeah. Um, well, the first thing would be to, you know, follow on um, Instagram and and uh, subscribe to our Love, Love Letters, which is our, our newsletter that we send out. Mm -hmm. Most of those are um, are literally just like love letters. They're just like, hey, here's a situation I have. Do you have the situation? Like, you know, here's what here's what here's what gets my gall. Here's what stops me. Do you have this? Right. So, so we try to be very vocal and, um, um, Barcelona and moving has shuffled, shuffled, shuffled the, the, the schedule a little bit. We're getting back to like the regularity of sending it out, you know, once or twice a week. Yeah. So the news, the newsletter. Um, and if you really want to get curious, then you go into, um, um, two things. Ooh. One is um, Born Creative, which is up now. That's on the, that's on the site. And Born Creative is my uh, the master class that I put together, which is based on that twenty years of teaching at the School of Visual Arts. And I literally take people through. Um, um, I've got a I've got a I kept this class small so we could we could get some work done. Um, four people, and the whole thing is filmed. And I give them abstract assignments, meaningless assignments, meaningless. Not like 
reggae album, because if I say reggae album or I say a milk carton or I say, you know, certain, all these, we get all these um, cliches, all these yeah. references come up. Milk, cows, white, uh, farms, like the shape of the thing, all that, you know? But if I say big nothing, little nothing, ugh, nothing comes up. If I say um, always the other, that's a classic Victoria assignment. Always the other. Okay. Design that. Show me that in two dimensions. They're like, what? Huh? What? No. So I, I show them how they can not only show me always the other in two dimensions, I can show them how to take what they've come from because they all they have is their opinion. They present their opinion and I say, okay, now how do we change the world with that? Now, now I'm the client. I've given you, I've given you a hundred, a hundred thousand dollars. I want a, um, a, uh, a billboard campaign. How are we going to take that s simple thing and 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 change people's ideas on culture or on n never politics, but how on culture or social issues or this or that? And it is fascinating how quickly they get there. From from a complete abstract to something that literally has meaning for other people, it's great. I love it. So, um, so that's that's the that's the master class that we have up now, and we're just about to um um one of my dates in the next two weeks. I don't have the dates in front of me. the The next couple of Mondays, we're going to start really we're going to start um a new subscription, and there'll be three different three different three different levels, and it's called um uh, the right answer. Or excuse me, the right question, because that's the thing. We get a lot of questions, but we don't get the right question. Yeah. So it's going to be, it's going to be built on the aud audience writing in their questions and me answering them um, and help literally trying to help people go from, I've got these drawings. What do I do now? So Born Creative. Yeah. Uh, it's a self-study course. Is it two hundred dollars one ninety nine? It's two hundred dollars, and I yeah, I think yep. I think we we are we were going to give you a, a a discount for your audience. Okay, we'll include the link in the show notes. If you're watching this on YouTube, check the description below. If you're listening to this, we'll include it in the show notes. We'll provide all the links that James talked about, including his Instagram handle, so you can go check him out. You can subscribe to his love letters, and we'll give you a code that you can use if you wish to go down this rabbit hole. I do want to point out something that the assignment that you described is pretty genius. As a teacher myself, I identify as a teacher, I've taught for over 15 years, not as long as you, but I can see the genius in the assignment and the way it's constructed. It says a lot about the teacher. <laughs> so when James is talking to you about this assignment, but is, did you say the big nothing or the big uh, 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 Big nothing, little nothing. Big nothing, little nothing. What he's trying to do is give you a brief that you can't fall into any tropes, any patterns, any... Uh, instant easy solutions you really have to think and you have to pull something out within yourself yeah so you're like okay fine james victoria i'll just make something abstract and weird and you'll be happy and then the second part to his assignment now you got to go make it commercial so now he's activating both parts of your brain in its purest form right brain creative left brain let's go make some money that i don't know how else to end this episode except for james is going to teach you how to get paid to do what you love in the most beautiful way and in that happy space in between i think we can be successful happy productive humans awesome yeah james victoria it's been a pleasure dude christo you're a genius i love you thank you so much it's mutual